In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. And so today, uh, thank you all for joining us again. We're going to continue on in James chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles ready, um, uh, we're gonna, we, I believe that we were in the fifth verse. Um, but just uh, we'll do a quick summary, not to belabor it because it is recorded. So um, if you remember that the theme uh, for the entire book of James is around faith and works. And if we remember, the people are struggling with hypocrisy. And there's a split between um, walking the walk and talking the talk, right? Between uh, your faith and a practical application of that faith, uh, which is the works the, or the deeds. And so if we remember some of the characteristics from the book of James is that it's a very practical book. It's a very um, easy, clear, concise. There's a balance between love and rebuking at the same time. There's, there's teachings. And so this is a pastoral letter and not to be confused with something that's like overly the top theoretical or, uh, um, or theological, but it, it's more of a practical how to live your Christian faith. And if you remember the outline of the entire book of James, um, it's five chapters long and uh, they can be sort of summarized in these different ways, like faith in temptations, faith in works, faith in the tongue, and, and so on. And we were in chapter one, which is, again, faith in temptations. And if you remember the outline of chapter one, uh, it was about uh, a small greeting uh, from the very beginning. And then the focus turned to how do we face outward temptation? Um, how do we resist this temptation? And so that's where we're going to start up today, around verse five. Um, to seven, and hopefully we'll see how far we go into. And then after that discussion, we'll go into um, fighting the inner temptations and what is our role as children of God, right? Listening and doing, actually applying uh, some of the practices that we preach. And so if you remember, we were in verse five, and verse five read, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And so the question that we're, we're thinking about and we're contemplating on is, you know, how do we endure temptations? Um, and St. James says, very frankly, first, by uh, obtaining heavenly wisdom, right? It's through heavenly wisdom that we realize God's will and his promises and his promises specifically to those who endure patiently to the end. And so that person who... Um, who is able to endure patiently, they're able to rejoice in, over their temptations. Um, some may think that they lack wisdom, so they don't know how to respond to persecution. And so what should they say, in other words, when they're challenged about their faith? How should they respond to being insulted or dragged to the courts? Well, St. James says simply, you only need to ask from God. And this wisdom will be given. It's an amazing promise. And the question for all of us to really contemplate is, do we, do we actually have the faith to believe in these promises? Or do we just skip right by them? See, our Lord says, you just need to ask of God, and this wisdom will be given to you, liberally. He's not stingy with his gifts. He is the one to give all men, generously, liberally, spontaneously, openly. Uh, and he is the one to give without reproaching his children um, because of their mistakes. So if we ask God, and, and, and he will give them all the wisdom they need to respond to each situation. But here's the catch in verse 6. But let him ask in faith. Let him ask in faith uh, without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. The, the thing is, sometimes we feel like God has abandoned us. We feel like, why is it sometimes that we don't receive? Or the perception that we don't receive. No, it, it, we are the ones who turn uh, God's overflow and abundance of love into, um, into the feeling of the lack because of our unbelief, right? That's why St. James says, but let him ask in faith. We need to ask without having a divided heart, without between uh, seeking God's wisdom and depending on our own wisdom, right? That's between God's love and the love of earthly, earthly matters without wavering, without being in, in the middle. Um, the person who wavers, we need more dis moral decisiveness, right, in our approach to God. We need to repent from being double-souled, double-minded, 
right? Trying to live both as one of this world and as one as, as God's servant at the same time. It doesn't work. And so the doubter, the one who doubts, has no moral stability. It's like a surging wave of the sea, which is wind-driven and tossed by the passions of life. And so in verses 7 and 8, For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. In all his ways, in all his dealings, he is restless and unreliable. The one who is not decided in his choice to serve God or, and, and not let the world um, take over, right? If we focus on looking for the world to, to give us what we need in terms of wisdom and things like this, we'll never receive um, satisfaction. We're always going to feel like we need more and more, and we won't be satisfied. Um, so persecution will find that person, and, and that person will be at a loss. When the persecution comes and starts to heat up, uh, that person will be found out for their true faith. Uh, St. John Cassian says something very beautiful. He says, who is sure that his prayers will not be answered? Who is this miserable one? He is the one who prays and does not believe that his prayers are answered. And I, and I pray that we're not like this. I, I hope we're not going through the motions in our prayers and we really believe in, and understand the promises that God has given us and that he will help us endure these persecutions and these trials that come upon us. So again, what are we contemplating here? We're, we're contemplating how do we endure temptations? First, it was verse 5. Verse 5 says, by obtaining heavenly wisdom. Okay. Second is by obtaining humility. But let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. And so the heavenly wisdom removes the ego. Um, then when the ego is removed, we can experience the true humility. And, and we really understand the cross. And the cross reveals its true beauty. And we have a very deep understanding and appreciation for the cross. So the lowly brother, the one who is poor in the, in the worldly concept of being poor, can, can boast and glory in his exaltation, rejoicing in how God has chosen the poor to be rich in salvation, bypassing those rich who are wise in their own eyes. And so we're comforted knowing that no persecution can take away his true riches, which await him in heaven. So the time of trials uh, serves only to reveal the exaltation of the lowly, okay? And so, but the rich in his humiliation, notice he directs his speech here to the rich people. Doesn't say brother, right? If you, if you look in verse 9, uh, he says, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. But in verse 10, he doesn't refer to the rich as brother. Um, he doesn't want to confuse and say, you know, as if he's complimenting them because of their riches. No, it's only through humility that one can endure temptation. Persecution reveals the true state of the rich. When he or she is, you know, despoiled or his riches are taken away, it, it's a very difficult and humbling reminder that we should not trust in riches, but in God. Um, because we all know that eventually we're, we will leave this world and we're going to leave everything with it and the wealth behind. Um, so again, how do we endure temptation? First, by obtaining heavenly wisdom. This is verse 5. Verse 9, by obtaining humility. And third, by realizing that the world will pass away. The world will pass away. The believer, um, realizing that he or she is here temporarily on this earth, they lift up their eyes towards a better life, enduring all suffering and temptation without grumbling, because we understand that everything in this world will pass away. We know it's temporary. We know all the temptations, the trials that come on us is temporary. And so uh, we pray that the rich can direct their attention towards the heavenly matters instead of being occupied with the beauty of flowers, right? As St. James is talking about. Right? We don't want to get caught up in these temporary things that catch our attention. Um, these things can dry up. These can, things can vanish in a moment. And, and, you know, we pray that the rich can put their attention towards the heavenly matters and they transform. By doing that, they transform their trials into a source of joy. And then 
In verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. It's an amazing promise. Again, is it something that we, we pass by quickly, or do we really contemplate and think about these promises? The crown of life. It's a very uplifting outlook uh, towards the heavenly matters, right? Um, when we forsake the, t- the temporary worldly riches, we, we yearn and long to enter into, this, um, into these temptations, right? When we graduate from these temptations, and when we realize and have the true perspective of what they are, and we declare our love to God. And so we receive the crown, it's our reward, we receive the crown of life, which is the reward for those who love him. It graduates the babies into strong men in their spirituality. As St. As James said, he said, blessed is the man, right? Happy is the man. It, it's, a very, um, it's a very good reminder of how beneficial the sufferings and the temptations are for our lives. Um, some may think that they're evil, but the saints, they didn't avoid them, but they sought after them with all their might, and they endured them courageously, becoming beloved of God, right? Receiving the, the crown of eternal life. Uh, you know, it's a reminder of what St. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. He says, Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so he, that person has been approved. I really love this quote from St. Augustine. He says, if you are gold, which we are, right? If we are that gold, why do you fear fire? For inside fire, you will come out pure. It's it's a reminder, don't fear the persecution. Don't fear these things that come upon us um, because it's through these that we're proved and we become purified. And we receive this amazing promise. And then he goes into discourse. And I think this area is, you know, for some people, this is a, is a very confusing idea. Are we tempted by God, right? And St. James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And so what we mean by evil here is not the tribulations or the afflictions. No, that's not evil, but it's sin and darkness, it's sin and darkness that don't fit with God's nature, right? Who is full of goodness, full of perfection. And so what St. James is emphasizing is that God is not tempting with sin. And so he does not tempt anyone. God does not tempt us with evil, right? But he allows the outer trials to test us. You know, maybe you would say, what's the difference between someone who is tested and someone who falls into temptation, right? When one is defeated by evil because of not struggling, then we can say that they fell into temptation, right? And they became uh, a slave of to sin. But when one is steadfast and enduring and um, struggling, then he is tested and he is not falling into temptation. There's a big difference. You know, sometimes we even say, We fall into this temptation where we say, God is angry with me. And he sends to me this catastrophe to destroy me. No. To blame God for suffering is a mistake. No one should imagine that his or her sins have so frustrated God that now he is overcome with the human desire for vengeance and that he is the cause of suffering. He's out to get us. No, he doesn't test anyone like that. He's not out to to destroy. He doesn't have a desire to destroy them, right? He does not test us to destroy us. No, it's to prove us, okay? And so uh, in verses 14 and 15, and he goes on to explain a little bit further. He says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when it is full grown, it brings forth death. This is a nice explanation of what really happens when we choose, when we choose to 
uh, fall into sin. One of the church fathers, I couldn't, I couldn't get the exact quote, uh, the reference, but it says, no sin could have dominion over us unless we accept it by our own free will, or if we have accepted a similar sin. For example, thoughts of lust or the, of the flesh cannot dominate one unless he enjoys these thoughts or if he's fallen to pride or anger where God's grace has forsaken him for he indulges in food. And so each one is tested and tempted when he or she is drawn away from safety and lured into danger by their own desire. And this desire is our rebellious determination to have our own way, to have our own will, to to satisfy our uncontrollable appetites. And so this desire, it's been said, we, we have to resist this at all cost. When it's conceived, it brings forth and gives birth to sin. And when sin is finished <clears throat> and mature, it, it brings forth death. And so our desires, our self-will, it may seem harmless, but they're lethal, right? When we're drawn and enticed, you know, the devil entices us with many inner and outer stumbling blocks, you know, for example, like lust of the flesh and worldly desires. These stumbling blocks, no matter how harsh, they don't force us, but they only entice us so that we can be drawn to sin, right? Our Lord Jesus Christ confirmed that. He says, my sheep hear my voice, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand in John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. And so this means that no force, no matter how large it is, can snatch the believer who hears our Lord's voice and follows him. However, if the believer does not hear the Lord's voice and instead listens to other voices, then he can be enticed towards sin. So the one who comes to me, he says, I will by no means cast out in John chapter 6. Our Lord says that he is the door, that when one enters by him, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So the, the problem is, the warning is, when one leaves the Lord, our Lord does not force him to stay. And then he is drawn from God's care, and then he's enticed by the devil. Many of the church fathers talk about these stages of sin, right? Um, and they demand us to struggle against the sin in the first stage, in the very beginning. Don't negotiate with sin, right? In the very, very beginning, uh, when it's conceived, right? Um, we try to fight it from the very, very beginning, uh, when it tries to entice us, not to let it have dominion over us. And, you know, the effectiveness of the sign of the cross uh, an inner cry of prayer, uh, crying out for, for mercy, for God's help in these moments, it can dispel these thoughts from the very beginning, right? But if we let the sin pass the first stage where we accept it and we're pleased with it, then this is by my own free will and we are responsible for it, right? I, I wanted to digress just a little bit. He said sin is completed in, in three stages, right? There is this excitement, right, to be enticed, to be, to be drawn to it, then to enjoy it, right, to, and then to, be, and to please it, to give birth to it. And we see the progression of sin happening here, where sin starts with the thoughts, or uh, sin starts in the heart, but it's not yet acted out. And then when we let it in, then it becomes an action. We do something about it. We fall into that sin. And then if we're not controlling that stage, then it becomes a habit and it can lead to death. I wanted to leave you with a, not leave you, but like I wanted to leave a, a link to this Google Doc that I put together. I've used it for other talks in the past, but I thought it was, you know, it's a, very applicable. What you'll find in this link, um, it is case, sens case sensitive. So like the capital R, the capital Q, those matter. Um, but when you log on and I, and I encourage everyone to read, um, from this, it's basically, um, St. Augustine where he compares the three different people that our Lord raised from the dead. And he compares the three 
and how the three represent the three stages that St. James is alluding to here, right? And so St. Augustine talks about the first person who our Lord raised from the dead, the little girl who wasn't, who just died, right? Who's still in the house. And then the second person was the widow of Nain's son who was being processed out of the city uh, in Luke 7. And then the third person who was Lazarus, who he raised. And no matter what stage of sin that we're in, whether it's still in the house or it's still act, if it's acted upon or if it's, it's in, you know, you're in the tomb of sin, um, our Lord calls each person out. And he says to rise each one. You know, um, we have to be careful. I think sometimes we don't stress the point enough from the very first one. Sin in the heart or the thoughts or that, that being uh, the sin being conceived of, right? That excitement, right? It takes place and it happens through memories. It happens through the senses like seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and touching, right? If the enjoyment is produced, so we have to pay attention to what our, what our kids and what we watch and what we listen to and what we interact with, right? Because it affects all of our senses. But if enjoyment is produced, then you know, we can control it. But it, for example, when we fast, when we see the food uh, and we lust after the tasting of the food is stirred within us, it, it can turn into enjoyment, right? And then, so the idea is what the Coptic church tries to preach is don't be lured and don't be enticed by that, by even the food. Control it. Don't let your body have exactly what it wants all the time, right? Um, and it's a good discipline if we can physically uh, strengthen our resilience towards food, then maybe we can, um, we can fight against the sin, which we don't want it to even entice our hearts, okay? And so um, I, I guess, it's, you know, for me, it's a message of hope. When you read uh, St. Augustine's uh, sermon, I, I summarized it, I condensed it into that Google Doc. But when you read that, that sermon that St. Augustine gives, it's a message of hope um, that we see our Lord raising those three stages of sin, those three dead people using different expressions. He says, little girl, I say to you, arise. He says, young man, I say to you, arise. And then he groaned within himself. And then he said, cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. No matter what stage, our Lord can call us and we can be called to repentance. And so St. James goes on to say in verses 16 and 17, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Again, he uses the term brethren. It's such an uplifting and, and comforting term. Don't be deceived, my brethren, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And so St. James refers to his flock as beloved brothers, right? He urges them tenderly. He says, don't be deceived into thinking that God doesn't love you. You know, the one gift among his innumerable gifts, which should never leave our minds, is the gift of the new birth, which we have received in baptism right? And we became his children, and he became our father, the father of lights, right? Referring evil, you know, uh, assigning evil to God it is, is wrong, it's false. God is the father of lights. Asking goodness away from uh, God is false. It doesn't make sense, for he is our father, right? Who does not accept that his children Seek any father besides him. So every good gift is for our own good. And every perfect gift is presented as a free gift, you know, from above. That is where, um, that is, there is a, 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 continu a continuous overflow from heaven towards us, from the father to his children. God does not allow testing and persecution so that we fall, but so that we succeed. And so that we become perfect and we become holy. He gives us only good things. And so we have to have that perspective when we're facing these very difficult things in our lives. He only gives us good things so that we can become perfect. 
And so the all good giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Every blessing in life that we receive, all the health, all the love, all the friendship, all the pleasure, all the peace, it all comes from God. God, he is light and love, and he will never change. He will never dim. He will never be obscured. And with him, there is no change. There's no shadow of turning. And I think at this point, I wanted to, to end here um, so that we can continue on, on a, uh, kind of a nice place uh, for next time. I wanted to open it up for any questions.